Okay, everybody, so we're going to resume back from our last lesson. Okay, so when you did the activity previously, uh, you have used the ammonia plant and then so-called check what pressure, what temperature would be good to increase the ammonia yield. Okay, so out of the whole activity, I just want to start off by a little, by the key points first. In terms of chemistry-wise from the learning activity, right? So it's really about how you can need to take note that increasing pressure will actually increase the yield of ammonia production. So pressure increase, ammonia production will increase. But of course, the downside comes with this. Okay, profit and startup cost is key. If I increase the pressure, okay, the system, the plant itself will be under a lot of pressure. Okay, if you increase it too much, the plant will explode. And also, if you need to have high pressure, you need to have better materials. So the startup cost actually becomes higher. With regards to temperature wise, okay, uh, do take note, temperature is a bit more complex because if you lower the temperature, you actually get better yield. However, the reaction becomes slow. So you can't really get to the end of the reaction that quickly. Okay, so if you increase the temperature, now you get a lower yield, but a faster reaction. So it's like a, you need to find a balance in terms of temperature wise. Okay, so actually to maximize profit, uh, in the plant wise, they will actually consider the material input and the product output. If my yield is low, that means I pump in a lot of material, but I only get a bit of ammonia out of it. Then there will be quite a bit of waste material there. Lah. So they need to consider okay, how they can balance the two factors itself. So for ammonia plant or the production of ammonia, the HIPAA process, the complexity comes with it being um, that it's not just about chemistry itself. It's also about um, there's that function of um, practicality when they're running the whole uh, plant, the whole production. Okay, so that's for the summary of your ammonia package. All th this one should be inside your uh, slides already. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Okay, all these questions here, I will not be going through now. I'll just be going through the main notes first, okay? So let's start off with this. Okay, what's the effect of pressure on ammonia? So this one is really a good recap on what we have gone through. So let me make the screen bigger. Let me zoom in a bit more. Okay, so it's easier to write out. Okay, so the higher the pressure, okay, the higher the pressure, actually, the higher the yield of the ammonia. Now, what this would actually mean is that if I increase the pressure, okay, so by increasing the pressure, I would have an increase in the rate of reaction as well. Because this one actually deals with your speed of reaction. Remember, if I can increase the pressure, my speed of reaction will increase. So this is on the chapter of idea of, um, this is from your ammonia chapter. This is actually from the speed of reaction chapter. So you can see we are linking up, you can see the cross link between chapters in, in this part here. Okay, but why we don't really use high pressure as mentioned, you need expensive equipment. Hence, okay, we will use a lower pressure. What's the pressure we're gonna use is 250 ATM. What's the word here that we are going to write is actually a compromise. So it is not really like, a, like the best, you know, it's like a, we kind of like compromise in terms of high pressure versus low pressure and then try to find the best fit out of the whole thing. Okay, so it is a compromise when we use 250. So therefore, when we are looking at pressure in the whole uh, ammonia plant, okay, the pressure indicated is 250 ATM. This is the pressure that's used. Okay, this is the pressure that's indicated in the textbook. Now, please don't be shocked huh? because sometimes when you see your uh, some of the other school papers or you see some of the text, right? They may not use 250 ATM. Okay, sometimes they may use 200 ATM. It's actually fine also. So in actual fact, the range of pressure that can be indicated is from 200 to 250. Okay, when you see some of the text, but when you are writing your answer in your um, in your exam questions and stuff, please go and use 250. Okay, so don't care what we will write, but in your writing, you should use 250. Okay, now this additional info, if you ever do go to um, study chemistry in the tertiary education, uh, you will learn about this concept. Okay, this is actually called the Le Chatelier's principle. Now, this is not in your syllabus, that's why we put it as additional syllabus, additional information. This is all under the idea of the Schittler's principle. So if you want to know more, you can go and Google it, but this is not required in your current syllabus. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this. Let's just go through the, uh, the rest of the other segments. 
Okay. Now, what's the effect of temperature? Okay, what's the effect of temperature on the yield of ammonia? So if I increase increasing the temperature, okay, actually increase the speed of reaction. I think this one, most of us are very clear of it. So increasing the temperature will actually lead to, a, to the increase in the rate of reaction. However, at high temperature, okay, what happens is that the ammonia will decompose back. Okay, the ammonia will actually decompose back okay, through the backward reaction. So, too high temperature, sorry, I realized realize the word temperature must be here, at high temperature, okay, ammonia will actually decompose back through the backward reaction. So, it's not a good thing. Okay, but then, if I put it at too high, okay, later on we will say, uh, hence, the Lower the temperature, the higher the U. Okay, sorry, huh? So high temp, it will decompose back, so the U will become very low. Therefore, we want to make the temperature low, low, huh? so they can get higher U. However, if the temperature is too low, huh? you put it until so low, it will actually reduce the rate of reaction, the rate of the forward reaction, which is not good. Because if the reaction is very slow, it takes forever just to produce your ammonia. Hence, once again, it is a compromise. Okay it is a compromise of the relative high temperature. Okay, we're going to use of like from 200 in your um, activity or 600. Generally, the one that you always see in your textbook, you'll see in the plants that's being used is 450 degrees Celsius. So 450 degrees Celsius is the condition, okay, is the condition for your ammonia production. So you have the pressure now, 250 ATM, atmospheric pressure, 250 atmospheric pressure, you have temperature which is 450 degrees Celsius. Next, okay, we want to speed up the reaction, okay, not just based on pressure and temperature, we're going to speed up the reaction using the catalyst. So in many of the industrial processes, actually a catalyst is used, especially if it's a reversible reaction, because it's going to speed up. So a catalyst is used to speed up the reaction, okay. Take note, it does not affect the yield. Okay, this is not only for this chapter in your speed of reaction, must also remember the catalyst does not affect the total volume produced or the total product produced. Okay, so why is it so? Okay, later on, we'll go into it. But what is the catalyst for the ammonia production is actually finely divided iron. Okay, finely divided iron. So three conditions for ammonia, 250 ATM, 450 degrees Celsius, finely divided iron. Okay, uh, I mean, if you see your textbook, they'll put the word catalyst, uh, but finely divided iron is the material that they're using. So how does the catalyst speed up the reaction? I think this one, we have uh, done it a few times. This is also in your WA1, but I'm just gonna uh, keep it short for everybody. So I'm just gonna draw this out, okay? So typically, if you use an energy profile diagram, so you always have the y-axis, which is the energy level. Okay, energy, this time in terms of kilojoules. So think of units, how many of you always forget your units. Energy profile diagram with the x-axis. The x-axis is actually the progress of reaction. Okay. Now, because um, ammonia production is, okay, is an exothermic reaction, therefore my reactants will be of a higher, um, higher start. My product will be of a lower start. Okay, lower energy level, higher energy level. So this one will be my N2 plus H2. Okay, this will be my NH3. Let's balance it a little bit. So this is three here, this is two here. Okay, how to exactly draw the whole graph? So this hump here, all the way down to the bottom. Okay, let's use a different color pen to indicate things. So dot, 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 dot. Uh, let's use purple color. Okay, so from the energy level of the reactants to the highest peak, this is the activation energy. Okay, let's use EA. Okay, to be more precise, this is the uncatalyzed one. Okay, so let's say this is the without catalyst. Okay, sorry, let's use no catalyst. I don't use the word uncatalyst. Uncatalyzed uh, sounds weird. Okay, no catalyst involved. Okay, then we also still have your typical energy diagram. You must make sure you always have your enthalpy change. Huh? Okay, enthalpy change. This is negative. 
Now, if I have a character list, how will the diagram look? So this one is really a quick recap where you're going to get a hum that's lower. Okay, another hum that's lower. From here to here, this is actually the activation energy with character list. So you realize the energy barrier is lower, it actually speed up the reaction. So how exactly to go about explaining it? Okay, the term used okay, is actually catalyst increases the speed of reaction. Increase speed of reaction by providing, by providing an alternative pathway. of lower activation energy. Okay, for the reaction to occur. So most of you, I remember in your WA, you forgot your, you wrote alternative pathway, but you forgot the idea of lower activation energy. Okay, so take note, the two terms should come together. It's an alternative pathway provided by the catalyst, which results in a lower activation energy. Okay, so this is for this slide over here. We talk about how temperature, pressure, and the catalyst affects the um, plant-wise. Okay, how, what's the conditions that should be used in terms of pressure, temperature, and catalyst? Or well, you realize I keep repeating these three because it's an important detail you must remember. Next. Now, uh, let's not go into the question. Oops, you can see the answer, sorry. Okay, let's not go into the question. Okay, now let's go on to this. How is ammonia recovered? Because in the whole plant, you do know that you don't get the maximum yield. There's only 10 to 15% of it um, produced. So what happened to the 85% of my reactants? Where does it go to? Cannot be, I release it out into the air, right? There's a waste of the resources, waste of the materials. So this is actually how the whole plant works. Okay, so first part, part one. Okay, nitrogen and hydrogen are mixed in a proportion, okay, of one is to three. Okay, one is to three by volume. Okay, so first thing go in one to three. So where did I get my nitrogen from? Nitrogen is actually gotten from the fractional distillation of air. Okay, fractional distillation of liquid air to be more precise. Then in terms of hydrogen wise, it's actually obtained from the cracking okay, of petroleum. As I mentioned, these are from your later chapters. You will be covering a little bit more in details back uh, later on. Okay, so I'm not going to go too much details into this. Next, once the, air, once the gas goes in in the chamber, one is to three, they're actually compressed. Okay, they're actually compressed. They're compressed to increase the pressure. So the mixture of gas is compressed okay, to 250 atmospheric pressure. So I mix the gas in, one is to three. I compress them to 250 atmospheric pressure. Then in the next chamber, number three, the gases are actually heated up to how much? Temp what's the temperature here? 450 degrees Celsius. So you can see it's a step by step, not everything all one shot on. Huh? Compress, then you heat. In this case here, you heat it and then you pass it over what? You pass the gas over the finely divided iron catalyst. Okay. The reaction is exothermic and setting only 10 to 15% of the reactants are converted to ammonia. Okay, there's a sad thing about it. So the other 85, 90 to 85 to 90% is actually pumped back. Huh? Okay, the mix, but before they pump back, they go through a cooling tank. What the cooling tank does is actually it cools the gas down. Okay, so that my ammonia can actually be condensed. So I cool the gases down. Okay, the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogens are pumped back into the com uh, converter for further reaction. So in a sense, this is like sort of like a recycling. So I recycled. Sorry, let me rewrite this. Huh? Okay, so the nitrogen and hydrogen is pumped back, sort of like a recycling. Okay, then because it is cool enough, the ammonia actually becomes a liquid. So the ammonia gas actually condenses okay, to form liquid ammonia. So you can see the whole flow here. Appreciate the whole thing. Okay, you can see that how the thing keeps going back in a cycle. Okay, how the whole thing keeps going back in a cycle. 
so that none of the materials are wasted and I can always get my product out. So those of you interested in doing engineering, okay, this is something you need to consider how to maximize the materials okay, so that I can maximize my profit. Okay, that's what engineers will do while you think of all these kind of ways, innovate. Okay, so key ideas here, the pressure that we need to remember is 250 ATM, pressure 450 degrees Celsius. The catalyst used is finely divided iron. Finely divided iron catalyst, huh? okay, finely divided iron. And this whole thing here, okay, the whole plant that you see at the top actually can be summarized into this diagram over here. Okay, the recycling happens here. Now, one of the common questions that likes to be asked okay, uh, whenever they talk about ammonia right, is that why must nitrogen and hydrogen be mixed in a volume of 1 is to 3? Okay, most of you will say, because NH3, uh, the formula 1 is to 3. Okay, that's why the ratio of nitrogen and hydrogen is 1 is to 3. But the other thing you must take note is this. You need to talk about how the volume, okay, is proportional to the mole. Because when we say the idea of one is to three, ammonia one is to three, actually you're referring to the mole. Okay, you're not linking it to the volume. Hence, there's this extra step that most people tend to miss out. Okay, so I will not go through the full explanation yet, but I just want you to take note, whenever they ask you the idea of one is to three, you must link not just about the formula of NH3, okay, in terms of the ammonia production side, Okay, you must also think in terms of the mole side also, mole concept. So this is a very tricky question. Most people tend to miss out one of the points. Now. Okay, so this is just to highlight certain things over here. Okay, next up. Okay, more questions, more questions for you to do. Okay, now let's go to slide 15. This one is actually a little bit uh, easier. Why do I say it's a little bit easier? Because you have covered this um, back in your acids and bases. Okay, what do I mean by that? Do you realize that this is actually ammonium salt? This is ammonium salt reacting with alkali. What's your product? You actually got ammonia, water, and the salt itself. So actually, you have covered this in the chapter of acids and bases. Okay, you have covered a bit of this in acids and bases. So instead of just seeing it as an alkali reaction or base reaction, you can also see it as a displacement of the ammonium. So... Let's fill up the blanks. So by heating or by warming, sorry, by heating, not by heat, okay, sorry. By heating or by warming, okay, a mixture of ammonia salt with uh, alkali and base, okay, the ammonia is actually displaced. Okay, this is known as a displacement reaction. So this is not the first time you have also encountered the word displacement reaction. You have actually seen this word also in the chapter of metals. You have also seen this word in the chapter of periodic table. So under metals, under periodic table, you would have seen this idea of displacement reaction. Okay, so this will be the third time you are, you are looking at this already. Okay, so what we are actually looking at whenever we see this kind of displacement reaction, okay, this is the ionic equation that's actually happening. It's actually the ammonium salt, the ammonium cation reacting, okay, or forming, uh, reacting with the hydroxide ion to give you ammonia gas and the water being uh, as a side product. Okay, so this is actually the ionic equation here. If you are good at ionic equation, in actual fact, you don't need to worry too much about this. Okay, you should be able to come out with it. But for those of you who are struggling with the writing equations, okay, and then maybe you don't have enough time for the exams, uh, you can choose to memorize this. Okay? Now, do take note, ammonium salts are actually soluble ionic compounds. We learned in the chapter of ionic compounds that most ionic compounds are actually soluble in water. Okay. So um, when they dissolve in water, okay, they will dissolve, they will form their individual ions and exist in the equal state la, because soluble in water, right? So it equals. Okay. Now, do take note when I want to dry my ammonia gas, okay, we should typically use quicklime. What's the formula? What's what's the name? Chemical name for quick lime and lime is actually calcium oxide. Okay, so this one we actually went through in chapter two. We went through quite a fair bit. What's actually happening is that the calcium oxide okay, will actually absorb the water to give you your calcium hydroxide. 
So it actually absorbs the water, okay, moisture as it goes through, okay, the calcium oxide. Okay? Now, so then the question will be, the next question will be, oh, so can I use concentrated sulfuric acid or concentrated hydrochloric acid to dry the gas? Answer here is obviously no. Lah. Okay, acid, acid. We do know that ammonia is basic, right? So actually, acids cannot be used. Okay, acids cannot be used. Because, okay, why? Because uh, it will react with ammonia, bracket, which has basic properties. The word basic just tells you it's sort of like the alkali properties, uh, which has basic properties. Okay. Hence, it cannot be called. Hence, it will not be. Hence, it will not be collected. Okay. So this is something that uh, you must take note. You can see how the chapters all keep linking up now, especially nearing the end of your season in Sec Four. You need to start to see how the different chapters are linked up. Okay, this is something important about it. So the last part here is ammonia gas can be collected by doing what? Okay, it's an upward delivery. Okay, the upward delivery is actually a downward displacement of air. Okay, I typically will not use the idea of downward displacement of air because upward, downward, most of you get confused. So I would typically write upward delivery because visually, I know my gas is being pumped up. Okay, so I will not normally use the word downward displacement of air. I will just say the, the idea of upward delivery. Okay, why is it so? It's because it is much less dense than air. Okay, and it's readily soluble in water. And so you say, sure, huh? I don't understand. Why less? Why? Why? Okay, this one I know link to upward delivery. La. Then why you suddenly talk about displacement? Why is it soluble in water? What's the idea? If the gas is soluble in water, means that I cannot use the displacement of water method. Okay, that's why you need to indicate uh, that also. Okay, so upper delivery, because it's less dense than air, and because it's soluble in water, you cannot use displacement of water method. Okay? So these are, uh, this is actually the last part of your whole chapter of ammonia. So you can see ammonia, a big chunk goes into the Haber process. Oh, yeah, a big chunk goes into the Haber process. Then the very last small segment goes into the ammonia gas collection itself. Okay, so really this will be the end already. Now to help everyone pull the things together, to help everyone pull the things together, so I just want to go through some uh, questions. Okay, so I just want to go through some of the questions itself. So I'm going back to slide eight. Okay, so slide eight, I will not go through the very, very simple one. Huh? So those very simple one I highlight in yellow, I expect you to be able to do on your own end. Huh? So this one, considered simple. How are they obtained? You know, this is based on memory work. I already said just now already. Okay, now this one over here is the interesting one. Okay, they say the actual volume of ammonia produced is less than the theoretical value. What is theoretical value? That means if I see N2, react with 3H2, I should get 2NH3 based on my mole calculation. Okay, based on the mole calculation. However, okay, however, um, this is a problem. Lah. Why is it not theoretical? So first thing, you must remember that it is not a one-way reaction. It is not a forward reaction, only. it's reversible. So what we can say is that the reaction Okay, between N2 and H2, H2 to produce ammonia. It's a reversible reaction. Right? First thing you want to say is a reversible reaction. So what does this mean? Okay, if it's a reversible reaction, okay, means that both forward and backward reaction 
occurs simultaneously. Simultaneously. Well, hopefully I spell correctly, yeah, but am I? Yeah? Well, if both forward and backward reaction occurs simultaneously. So if it occurs simultaneously, what's the impact of it? Therefore, under the condition of 250 atmospheric pressure, 150 degrees Celsius, and with the finely divided iron, only 10 to 15% of the reactants Sorry, uh, of the reactants are used up or are used to form ammonia. Okay, so first thing is reversible. Second thing is why is it less? It's really because under those conditions, only 10 to 15% are used up. Uh, therefore, the rest will have to be recycled back. Okay, okay so this will be part two. Under part three, okay, I think this one we mentioned it, so I'm not gonna go through that. Um, I think we did this one also. Okay, sorry, so I realized we went through all this. Let's go through another one. Okay, let's go to slide eleven. There's this idea of uh, there's this question on the percentage of ammonia obtained at the equilibrium is plotted against the pressure for two temperatures, four hundred and five hundred. Which of the following correctly represents the two graphs? So for this question, first thing you must remember. When the temperature increase, what happens to the U? The U will actually decrease. Okay, so this is the first concept I was bringing. When the temperature increase, my U will decrease because more ammonia will decompose. Therefore, what I'm going to see is that my 400 should be above my 500 based on concept number one. My 400 should be above my 500 because can you see yeah, this one 400 got more U than the 500. This one 500 got more U, so this one's out. This one's out. Next, pressure. Second point now will be the x axis, which is the pressure. When pressure increase, what happens to my U? My U will actually also increase. So if I compare my two graphs here, C will be out, therefore my answer will be. Okay, so this is, you can see here why the factors are so important because questions like this will tend to appear. Lah. Okay, uh, maybe let's go for another one. Okay, uh, you can see this on the same graph. Okay, so you realize this graph is very common. Lah, so you need to get used to it. Okay, this one, use the graph to describe the effect of increasing pressure and temperature and pressure on the U of ammonia. Look at it, it is two marks. Two marks. So, and then you can see here, must use the graph. If you can remember during the activity that time I did mention, so whenever they say use the graph or use the data, you must use the values that's given to you. Lah. Okay, so maybe first thing what we're gonna settle for is um, maybe look at pressure. Let's settle with pressure first. Okay, so what we can say is um, when pressure increase, okay, the U of ammonia increase. So this is stating the effect first. You will not get any marks for this yet because you have yet given any data. So what we need to do now is once we say the trend, let's try to put the data across now. So maybe we can use, you can use any one. So you can say at any one of the graph, let's use the 500, at 500 degrees Celsius. Okay. When pressure, increases from zero to, let's see the value here. So this is about 35, okay, sorry. So zero to, when the, okay, sorry. Yeah, when the pressure is increased from zero to 400 ATM, okay. The U increase from 0% to 35%. So this is how you describe for the pressure. Then next, of course, there's the temperature. So how to describe the temperature one? So we're gonna say the trend again. So when temperature increase, okay, 
the U of ammonia, the U of ammonia. You can see as the temperature increases, the U actually decreases. So the U of ammonia actually decreases. So what we're going to do now, we're going to do the same thing. Let's use 400 pressure. Let's use 400 atmospheric pressure. So I got three points of data over here. So I know that at 400 atm, so I'm going to summarize the data at 400 atm, comma, 450 degrees Celsius will actually give me about 50% yield. 500 degrees Celsius will give me about 35% yield. Then at 600 degrees Celsius, okay, I will get about 15% yield. Okay, so I need you to be able to read the data as such. So now it's time to answer how to trend. So we're going to say at 400 ATM, okay, that's my reference point. When temperature increase from 450 degrees Celsius to 600 degrees Celsius, the U decrease from 50% to 50%, 50% to 15%. Okay, now you realize I'm purposely taking time to do this because answering technique is something I need everyone to work on. And of course, I can't just say, let's do answering technique. Then, you know, I expect all of you to know how to learn. So it's actually by going through questions like this, that you get to familiarize yourself with some of the ways to answer certain questions. And some of you may say, sure, two marks only, you must write so much. You know? If you think carefully, the effect must link to the graph. So I need to have data to get my trend. Therefore, this top is only one mark. This bottom one is another one mark. So sometimes knowing how the marks are allocated, that is a very important process to be able to do all this. Okay? So this is for question, slide 12. Let's go through a bit more questions. Okay? To work on the... Oh, this one, you can see the answer. Okay, never mind. This one, I won't... Uh, this one, you all go home and do. Uh, I would want to go through now. I want to go through the subsequent ones. Let's go through the next one. Okay. Those MCQ one, never mind. Okay. Ah. Let's go through on slide 16, this bottom one, part PR. Ammonia is used to make fertilizers. Many fertilizers contain ammonium salts, such as ammonium nitrate. Farmer decides to add ammonium nitrate fertilizer onto his land, followed by calcium hydroxide. The farmer was advised by scientists to use fertilizers containing potassium nitrate instead. Explain what is correct. First things first. Fertilizers are actually to produce, are actually uh, providing nitrogen okay, to the plant. So if I look at it, ammonium nitrate, the formula is NH4NO3. So you can see here, H, one ammonium nitrate, one more ammonium nitrate actually produce, actually gives two moles of nitrogen. If I use potassium nitrate, KNO3, you realize, this one, one potassium, one more of potassium nitrate only give me one more of nitrogen. So in actual fact, but, um, Farmers right, would actually prefer to use this because it would give more nitrogen to my plants. So that's a consideration you must understand why farmers would prefer using this. But from the science point of view, what is the issue? Calcium hydroxide is a what? It's an alkali. Alkali, huh? If I put alkali with ammonium salt, what's going to happen? The ammonium is going to be displaced. So explain why the scientist is correct. First thing is really because Okay, you must talk about the reaction. Ammonium nitrate will react. It will react with the calcium hydroxide. And the ammonium cation. Will be displaced. Will be displaced. As ammonia. Okay, you want to be cancel a bit? Okay, la, we write the equation. La. Okay, so NH3, NH4, and NH4, NO3, NH4, NO3, plus I got my calcium hydroxide. Okay, then you can write out the whole thing. So the thing is this now, if you think carefully, let's say if I don't write the equation, I look at my this statement here. Do you think it's going to be worth two marks? Obviously, it's not. La. Okay, the reaction itself displays ammonia. 
you must remember you're in pure chem now. Okay, this is not going to be worth two marks. So what is the other part instead? So you scratch your head. I already explained ammonium nitrate already. Okay. Maybe let's add one more point that, you know, hence uh, maybe my plant, hence the plant will receive, okay, sorry, it's the wrong word. <laughs> receive lesser nitrogen. Okay, maybe this one can add one more mark for me, maybe. But let's say I want to be very, very safe. There's something else I haven't talked about yet, which is potassium nitrate. Why should I use potassium nitrate instead? Okay. So therefore, maybe this could be worth your first one mark. Your second one mark actually comes from your potassium nitrate. Okay. So you can say that uh, potassium nitrate will not okay, react with the um, calcium nitrate. Hey, cal calcium, calcium hydroxide. Hence, um, the fertilizer, fertilizer will be fully. Oh, sorry, my brain is thinking faster than my writing. Huh? The fertilizer will be fully. Um, fully absorbed, okay, by the plants, or by the, yeah, by the plants, uh. okay, there'll be no waste, so they won't waste your money, okay, so the no reaction part actually also would add value to the answers also, okay, so take note, think of the possible reasonings that can come, look at the mark allocation, make sure that you have sufficiently uh, done all this, Okay, um, this one, I you can see, la, this is another same kind of question that, that comes out. So this one, I'll leave it to you all to try to answer it. So I'm going to highlight in yellow because we have already sort of like gone through it. Um, this one, you can do it. This is the condensation part. This one, you realize the same kind of question keeps coming out. Ah, okay. This one will be the interesting one. This flow diagram, oh yeah, I think many of you, when you look at flow diagram, you think of qualitative analysis right from the very start. Uh, please don't think every single time is always qualitative analysis. Huh? Okay, so the flow diagram refers to the processes used in the manufacture. So how is air producing nitrogen? How is the raw material producing hydrogen? This A and this B is actually your fractional distillation of liquid air. B is actually your cracking of petroleum. Right? So process. C, how did nitrogen and hydrogen put together to give you ammonia is the Haber process. Okay. Then so I said, wow, sure. process D how? I don't know what's process D. We realize they never ask. Ah. So sometimes don't jump, don't jump the gun. Ah. They, you can look through some parts you may not know. You can just hold it there first. Okay. Because they may not ask. Ah. Okay. So ABC, you can go back. I already mentioned the answer. Here. You can go and write on your own. Say the conditions for C. See, conditions for C. So conditions, Okay, write an equation to show the formation. So most prop, if you look at these two marks, actually this is quite a demanding two marks because why? My condition, I got three conditions. Okay, the equation itself most probably is worth another one more mark. So this is actually a one mark allocation. This is another one mark allocation most probably. So the two marks are actually quite demanding. Huh? Okay, suggest a reagent E. Well, that's it. Sure. Never learned this process before. Don't even worry. Think about it carefully. This is a salt. This is a acid. Acid plus what gives you salt? Acid plus my alkali or acid plus a base. So this reagent E should be a base slash alkali. And what should my reagent E have? It must have my ammonium, right? So what is an alkali that has ammonium inside? The only other thing you know is this must be ammonium hydroxide. Okay. This is also known as your aqueous ammonia. Ionic equation, this one, you all go back and practice on your own. Uh, I won't go and write it down for you all. Okay, so I will stop here for the ammonia package because I think it really wraps it up quite nicely in terms of the things that we can test you. First, the Haber process. 
okay, what's a reversible reaction, what are the conditions, okay, how to read graphs and read data. The second portion that keeps coming out, you realize is the displacement of ammonia. So that's another one that you will need to just take note of it. Okay, no be I can't say use the word no, is be familiar okay with the displacement of ammonia with alkaline. Okay, so that's for all the portion on the um, ammonia package ready. So I'm gonna stop the uh sorry, uh, let me let me try to do this. Let me stop the video. Uh. Okay, my I think it's not really working. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Ariel, can you help me? Uh, is it possible for you to stop the video for me? Uh? Stop the recording for me. Uh, 